From Hollywood, it's Out of My Mind. I'm Jay Douglas, and today in Episode 3, we're going from the Broadway stage to the little screen to the big screen, with a stop along the way to look in the mirror. That's what happens when you mix curiosity with technology. You get a show about the essential, the non-essential, and the curiously essential goings-on in the world. Now, you may have heard that this is a show for baby boomers, but you can listen even if you're not a baby boomer. In fact, I recommend it. When you see what your parents and grandparents are curious about, you'll understand why they turned out the way they did. So, please, stick around for the next 17 minutes or so as the curtain goes up on Episode 3 of Out of My Mind. Summer vacation time often means theater time. From Broadway to summer stock to community theater, watching a play can be a welcome relief from the explosions, chase scenes, improbable plots, and chase scenes of Hollywood blockbuster movies. Did I mention the chase scenes? You know, in the theater, it's not only the actors who have to learn their roles. Audience members do, too. Christine Cox has been the house manager of the Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles for 16 years, more than enough time to have seen it all, and to be able to offer suggestions for improving your performance as an audience member, starting with showing up. Try to arrive at like 7.30 for an 8 o'clock curtain, because then you'll probably get here at 7.45. Everybody's coming to the same place at the same time, so try to give yourself enough time and watch everybody else shuffle around quickly. If you do arrive late, and it happens, Christine has two things she wants you to rehearse, patience and consideration. We want to give the inside audience enough exposition time that they may, you know, the people that are late may need to be held out for the first 10 to 15 minutes or the first scene or a first song so that there's an appropriate break to interrupt a little bit and get everybody else in. Keep in mind that the usher is going to try to get you in there as quickly and as safely as possible. We're going to have a flashlight. Uh, they're going to try to explain to you, you've got two seats on the aisle, or you need to step over two people, or watch your step, there's a step going down. So we try to have that conversation outside in the lobby before we take you in in the dark. Don't talk while you're going in there. That's why we did that all outside. Uh, don't go, oh my gosh, look at all the people, or look what's going on on stage. Once inside, you may find yourself in conflict with other audience members, whose actions, from talking to having an assisted listening device turned up too loud, are distracting. Christine says playing it low-key is a better choice than getting all emotional. I always do that approach of, you may not be aware, but your actions are a little bit bothersome to those around you, or something to that sense. And a lot of times they will go, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't aware. Don't go and scold somebody. But if you just, again, say, you may not be aware that you're really, that candy that you're unwrapping is really loud, or something along that line. Above all, says Christine, don't act like that person you don't want sitting next to you. One way to do that is by imagining it's the 1960s, when cell phones didn't exist. Don't text during the show, isn't this the best thing I've ever seen? Or people will text to each other if somebody's late. I'm here. There's no reason to tell them. Leave their ticket at the box office and we will get them in at the appropriate time. But don't text back and forth. You can take a picture in the seating area of, let's say, the curtain or the scrim um, that might say, ain't misbehaving or blithe spirit, and then that would be your social media thing to say, here I am. But the show itself is copyrighted. Legally, you're not supposed to be capturing those images and putting them out there for the world. It's a copyright issue. And then at the same time, people with their videos and wanting to post those, it's illegal, truthfully. And, and I think it's bothersome to those around you if you're sitting there paying more attention to taking a picture than actually watching the show. We're used to acting out our lives in private spaces these days, our living rooms, our cars and such. Christine suggests that when you come to the theater, you play against your type and take on the role of someone who lives a life in public. You, you want to be aware of those people around you. It's not like watching um, TV in your living room where you can get up, I mean, I'll have fights over armrests. You want to be careful that you want to share your space. You want to enjoy the fact that you've got people enjoying the same thing around you. That's half of the reason you go is because you want to experience it with other people. But please try to be aware that you're sharing this space. It's not just you in that theater. Christine Cox is the house manager of the Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles. 
You can read more about Christine and the Amundsen in the show notes. Just go to bit.ly slash OOMM123. Click on episode three and then follow the link to show notes. Christine will be back in episode four with some tips on taking young children to the theater. Years ago, they used to they used to have you adjust the side mirrors sitting, you know, in the driving position and adjust it to just see the rear of your car because people I think they get a sense of security seeing their own vehicle. That's Barbara Ward, a traffic safety specialist with AAA Northeast. When I read that most drivers, uh, including me, have been aiming their side view mirrors incorrectly and that a simple adjustment would make us safer on the road, I called Barbara and asked her to help us out. What we're doing now is if a driver gets in the vehicle, they're going to lean their forehead on the driver's side window and adjust the side mirror to just be able to see the rear of their car. When they sit up, they will not see their car anymore. Let's suppose you're driving on the highway and you have a vehicle behind you. As it turns or changes lanes to the left, you're going to actually see that car go from your rearview mirror to your driver's side mirror. You're never going to lose sight of the vehicle. And then you're going to see that vehicle pretty much to, uh, up until it's like at the center of your car. That's, that's the point where it's going to leave your mirror, but then you're going to be able to pick up the car from your peripheral vision. It takes a little more stretching, but aiming the passenger side mirror follows pretty much the same principle. What they're going to do is they're going to either have their head right underneath the rearview mirror in the center of the rearview mirror or right over the center console. You're adjusting the passenger side mirror the same way so you can just see the rear of your car. Now, when a car passes you on the right, you'll be able to watch it move alongside of you until you can pick it up in your peripheral vision. Barbara Ward is a traffic safety specialist with AAA Northeast, and she spoke with us from her office in Garden City, Long Island. She has some more tips on traffic safety for this summer driving season, and I'll post them in the show notes. Sitting outdoors at a picnic table in Griffith Park in Los Angeles, actress, producer, and director Jessica Cameron and I talked about her impressive body of work. Uh, certainly Camel Spiders right now, which is playing constantly on Sci-Fi Channel in America, stars in Canada, and then all over the UK, is really well known. It's a sci-fi film. Um, I did a film called Truth or Dare, which is a really nasty, awesome torture flick that I directed, yeah, two years ago that did just finish the festival rounds with uh, 34 awards and even more nominations and nearly 50 official selections. And then our latest one that I directed called Mania, uh, that one is getting the most press of anything I have ever done. Yes, a talented, confident woman dedicated to her Hollywood career and to solving this little problem. I would take an intruder with a knife over a small spider in my apartment. Sure, there are lots of people who are afraid of spiders, but how many of them arm themselves with five cans of bug spray to walk from their car to their apartment. What's worse, Jessica's genre of choice is horror films. In fact, she's known as the Scream Queen, a talent she declined to demonstrate in public out of real concern that it would frighten nearby children. When you act in horror films, sooner or later, you're going to come across spiders. Jessica discovered that combining her fear and her art made her a better actress. You're not having to create a fictitious fear. You're just living. You just put yourself in the fictitious situation and then do everything you would do if it was real. Um, but it's a really interesting place to sort of be when you're an actress and you're utilizing something that's such a very real concern and a real fear. And she saw that acting in these roles was having an effect on her phobia. I am assuming, I didn't really ever think about it in that term, but I would assume that it's only helped simply because, you know, I'm, I'm definitely better than I am, than I have been the last three years. I've been really able to sort of keep my phobias in check and not let them affect my social life. For the record, even though we were sitting at a picnic table, Jessica never once checked it, or the nearby area, for spiders. I was curious whether she would recommend acting as a form of therapy. I don't want to say that because I don't want somebody to accidentally, like, you know, kill themselves or something and be like Jessica said. <laughs> I was afraid of heights, so I jumped off a 40-foot cliff. Don't do that. That's just bad. 
I think it's a smart move to explore your fears in depth and to sort of fully understand, if not necessarily where they come from, why they exist and how you can rationalize it. I don't think I'll ever get to the place where I can touch a tarantula, um, but I can go to a zoo and just avoid where the tarantulas are. It's a process, but Jessica certainly has a leg up on her fear. Or in this case, a leg up, a leg up, a leg up, a leg up. Jessica leg Cameron up. is an actress, producer, and director. You can read more about her and her career on her webpage. I've posted a link to it in the show notes. I was really busy growing up. It was a full-time job. If it was for you, too, we all might have missed some of the small but great films of the 60s and 70s. But don't worry. Mark Horowitz is a 35-year veteran of international film and television sales, and he loves those films. And from time to time, he'll join the show and share some recommendations of ones that are worth a second or maybe a first look. Today, Mark revisits Peter Sellers in The Magic Christian. The plot of The Magic Christian um, follows the adventures of Sir Guy Grand, played by Peter Sellers, and his adopted son, Youngman Grand, played by Ringo Starr. Um, it's episodic in nature, the plot, uh, that meaning that the story, although linear, from has a beginning, middle, and an end, is told in a series of episodes of sm almost small, standalone short stories, skits, have you will. They come together to form the entire plot. In this premise that Sir Guy Grand believes, as he's teaching his, his adopted son, that every man has a price, and they're rich enough to find out what that is. So in a series of episodes, they start out very small, starting with how much will a traffic warden except to eat the parking ticket instead of deliver it, and culminating in the cruise of the Magic Christian from which the movie gets its title. The Magic Christian throughout this movie is being billed as the ultimate boat, the ultimate cruise ship, and it's having its maiden voyage to the United States. And only the upper crust of the upper crust will be allowed to be, uh, to be invited to, to join the ship. So, of course, this piques uh, Sir Guy Grand's interest. Um, and we follow him and his family as they go on board the Magic Christian, where every sort of humiliation and degradation is, is heaped upon these, this, the, this, the elites of society. Besides Ringo Starr and Peter Sellers, who are absolutely brilliant, there were a number of cameos. In fact, the whole movie is peppered with cameos, including Wilfred Hyde White, Great, great British character actor, Sir Richard Attenborough, Christopher Lee, who does a fantastic striptease to Hamlet, Spike Mulligan, who was Peter Sellers' partner in the original Goon Show, um, Raquel Welch, Lawrence Harvey, Yule Brenner, and two favorites that even post-baby boomers will know, John Cleese and, Je and Graham Chapman. Oh, a correction. Um, it was actually Lawrence Harvey who does the striptease to Hamlet. <laughs> Christopher Lee, who actually plays a, um, a vampire. Also in there is a very young Roman Polanski, um, who is the object of Yul Brenner in drag's sexual desires. The film was shot in 1969. It was released in 1970. The background of this era was Woodstock had just happened. Uh, the war in Vietnam was in full swing. The protesting... Uh, against the war, both in the U.S. and around the world, was, was accelerating. The U.S. had just come off of a horrible few years of assassinations and race riots. The hippie movement was growing. And in general, the youth was starting to question the authority of their, their elders. And this was reflected not only in the streets, but also in the cinemas. Uh, that year, two of the top ten films were quite subversive for their times, M.A.S.H. and Little Big Man. The Magic Christian... Um, went a bit further <laughs> as far as its dark humor and subversiveness in order to get its point across. Um, in fact, when it was first released, it was panned by the critics universally as too heavy-handed and too dark. In retrospect, I, I just came back and watched this again, and I found it for two reasons. One, I think that it's, it's quite nostalgic in terms of the times, it's a great reflection of the times, not necessarily as we might have remembered them, but as they actually were. I mean, the footage is, is phenomenal. It's amazing to see a young Ringo Starr, a young Peter Sellers, uh, absolutely beautiful Raquel Welch. But also it's a memory, although it's a, a bit of a, a cranked up version of just 
how big that gap was getting, the generation gap, I remember they called it, between youth and adults. Um, and it, the satire in it is brilliant. It's interesting also, I think, in nostalgia to see this confluence of the Beatles, uh, the Monty Python people, the older comedians, Peter Sellers, Spike Mulligan, and then the much more mainstream actors of England, like Richard Attenborough and Lawrence Harvey, um, coming together in one group. And it's, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant piece. You know, we grew up in that world, in the world of change, where the, the war, the, the war, the war, we all know it as the war, the Vietnam War was, was so important and loomed so large in our lives, and, and hippies, and, and drugs were coming in vogue, and questioning authority, and, and, and these are the people who showed us how to do it with humor, uh, and they showed us how to get away with it. I want to thank Mark for bringing the Magic Christian to our attention. In spite of being a big Peter Sellers fan, this is one that I missed. If you did too, you can find it on DVD. Mark had much more to say about the film, including interesting background stories on the writer and director. You can listen to Mark's commentary in the show notes. In the language of Hollywood, that's a wrap. Out of My Mind is back next Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern with a brand new episode. Between now and then, remember that you are as much a part of the show as Barbara, Christine, Jessica, and Mark. So let me hear from you. Go to bit.ly slash OOMM123. Click on Episode 3, and you'll find several different ways of sending me your comments and suggestions. Thanks for being here, and let's talk next week. I'm Jay Douglas. Out of My Mind is produced by Penny Summers and is a production of the Theater of Your Mind Incorporated, Hollywood, California.